Patriot Act acting as the equilibrium on the desired road to tyrannical fascism in America. They're too good at what they're doing. They create the crisis on record. They sell the fraud. Then they say, give us more power. Give up your sovereignty, Europe, America, and we'll fix it. But then it only implodes faster. They make bigger bonuses, but they're destroying their own golden goose. They're hacking it open greedily. When it's giving them a golden egg every morning, they think there's eggs inside. Uh, I, I think the point you made, of the because the, they're on record creating this to consolidate power. They've bragged about it. Uh, you know, those, those memos have been made public by Goldman Sachs and others, but they're going to fry things so badly the bankers are all running to private islands with their own security teams. I mean, like th th they want to rule everything so much and have just so many digits in their bank accounts that they're going to devalue the value of the digits through their sheer greed. That is a possibility. And if you look at the Hegelian dialectic, uh, if that, that crisis at the beginning spins out of control, uh, they lose the tail end of the dialectic, don't they? Uh, there will be no synthesis at the end. They'll be lucky if they survive. Another method to manipulate the masses is the use of two opposing views to attain the desired view. Politician A espouses the first view. Politician B counters with the differing view. A clear example of this was the debate over the unconstitutional NDAA bill of 2012. I strongly believe that the United States government should not have the ability to lock away its citizens for years and perhaps decades without charging them and providing a heightened level of due pro process. We don't pick up citizens. We don't incarcerate them for 10 or 15 or 20 years or until hostilities end and no one knows when they will end without giving them due process of law. The great concern that we have now in terms of the security of the homeland uh, is from so-called uh, homegrown terrorists, radicalized Americans. So uh, these people, in my opinion, have, have uh, taken sides. They've joined the enemy. And uh, to have this body at this time as the threat of homegrown terrorism rises, say no, they can't be treated as enemy combatants, uh, is not, not only doesn't make sense and, and is uh, uh, totally uh, um, uh, unresponsive to the facts that I've just described. President Obama threatened to veto the bill as long as it contained the section concerning due process and then quickly changed his mind before the final version was voted through Congress. Obama then told the media that the version he had signed was revised to eliminate any threat to freedom of American citizens, even though this was not true, and the bill gives extraordinary powers to detain American citizens without a trial. The media synthesized Obama's lie by claiming that Obama will not use the powers he now has. The desired result is synthesized by mainstream media as they turn a blind eye to the debate. The American people cave into the lie because the process it is attached to seems so familiar. John Bound, InfoWars Nightly News. And that brings us to our next segment. There are literally hundreds of examples throughout history of government-sponsored terrorism, known as false flag operations. And chances are that the United States and Israel plan on orchestrating such an event to be blamed on Iran as a pretext for war. It is a fact that virtually every single war since the Spanish-American War of 1898 has included the use of a false flag operation as an excuse to enter into conflict. But unfortunately, the lies have been covered after the fact, too late to prevent mass death and destruction. In 1953, the CIA and British intelligence staged terror attacks to overthrow the democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh had nationalized Iran's oil fields and denied British petroleum a monopoly. U.S. and British intelligence operatives launched a successful coup d'etat and overthrew the Iranian government, replacing the regime with a ruthless dictatorship while seizing control of Iran's oil supply. 1964. 
U.S. warships were apparently attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats, an incident that kicked off the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The attack was a staged event that never actually took place. What followed was an excuse by President Lyndon Johnson to dramatically expand the scale of the Vietnam War. Ultimately, at the cost of three or four million dead Vietnamese and 58,000 Americans. June 8, 1967. The USS Liberty, an American naval vessel sailing off the coast of Gaza, was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of Israel. The well-coordinated attack, which lasted for hours, resulted in the deaths of 34 crewmen, 170 injured, and catastrophic damage to the ship, one of the most highly decorated vessels in U.S. history. Egypt was to be blamed for the attack, to serve as a pretext to drag the U.S. and her allies into war in the Middle East. If not for the heroic efforts of the ship's captain and his brave crew, the Liberty would have faced almost certain destruction. The truth about Israel's attack and subsequent White House cover-up continues to be officially concealed from the American people to this day. Now, in recent weeks, we have seen a massive buildup in the Persian Gulf by both the United States and Britain. Meanwhile, U.S. and Israeli intelligence sources are officially warning of domestic terror attacks inside the U.S. and Israel. And if a conflict is to ignite in the Persian Gulf, it is highly likely that the U.S. or Israel will use a false flag operation to kick things off. And that brings us to our quote of the day. Ask yourself... Would a government that has lied us into two wars and is working to lie us into an attack on Iran shrink from staging terrorist attacks in order to remove opposition to its agenda? And that was by Paul Craig Roberts, the former secretary to the Treasury in the Reagan administration, also known as the father of Reaganomics and a frequent guest on our show. I actually think uh, he was referring to the Bush administration when he made that statement, but I'm sure Craig Roberts wouldn't put it past the Obama administration to carry out a false flag terror attack as well. But, you know, I mean, they're both run by the same offshore banking cartels and the military industrial complex. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Now, uh, that does it for the first half of our show. We're going to go to break. But when we come back, I'm going to interview author Matthew Stein. He's the author of When Disaster Strikes, a comprehensive guide for emergency planning and crisis survival, we're going to discuss the unthinkable, surviving a nuclear disaster. So stick with us. This is information I'm sure you're going to want to see. It could very well one day save your life and the lives of your loved ones. Matt Stein, when we return, right after this. We were brought up loving our country and our Constitution. That in the United States of America, we were free. And that's an attitude that we've tried to instill in our children. I met my wife while uh, in the Air Force. I was a combat pilot in Vietnam. I served in Desert Storm as a commander. When I graduated from the academy, I took the oath of office. Uh, and as a commander, I administered that oath to many people. Now I, I wonder about the understanding people have of our Constitution. And I think about our candidates for President of the United States. Uh, it's interesting to see the support Ron Paul gets from the military. And if we think back to the code of conduct uh, and people raising their right hand that they were gonna support and defend the Constitution of the United States, why would those same people support in great numbers Ron Paul? I think it's because they know that he supports the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't mean you have to go to war to do it. Uh, it means you have to understand what the Constitution is and be a supporter inside of your own country, whether you're in the military or not, of that Constitution and make the United States strong. And Ron Paul does that. That's his feeling, that's his thrust. And that's why if you look at the percentages that support him and the military, it's huge. Why is that? because they've raised their right hands and they're putting their lives on the line for us here in the United States. And they know that Ron Paul does the same.
Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Once again, I'm your host, Darren McBreen, sitting in tonight for Alex Jones. Now, before we talk with Matthew Stein, I want to play a short video clip that I found on the NASA.gov, their official website. And it is a guide to solar flares. I thought it would be a good educational piece to share with our viewers before we start the interview. Let's take a look. Solar flares may seem like faraway events, but they can damage satellites and even ground-based technologies and power grids. Every 11 years, as the sun reaches its maximum activity, they become bigger and more common, and that increases the chances that one will significantly affect Earth. So what are these solar eruptions? A solar flare is basically an explosion on the surface of the sun, ranging from minutes to hours in length. Large flares can release enough energy to power the entire United States for a million years. Flares happen when the powerful magnetic fields in and around the sun reconnect. They're usually associated with active regions, often seen as sunspots, where the magnetic fields are strongest. Flares are classified according to their strength. The smallest ones are B-class, followed by C, M, and X, the largest. Similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes, each represents a tenfold increase in energy output. So an X is 10 times an M and 100 times a C. Within each letter class, there is a finer scale from 1 to 9. C-class flares are too weak to noticeably affect Earth. M-class flares can cause brief radio blackouts at the poles and minor radiation storms that might endanger astronauts. It's the X-class flares that are the real juggernauts. Although X is the last letter, there are flares more than 10 times the power of an X-1, so X-class flares can go higher than 9. The most powerful flare on record was in 2003, during the last solar maximum. It was so powerful that it overloaded the sensors measuring it. They cut out an X-17, and the flare was later estimated to be about X-45. A powerful X-class flare like that can create long-lasting radiation storms, which can harm satellites and even give airline passengers flying near the poles small radiation doses. X-flares also have the potential to create global transmission problems and worldwide blackouts. So the question is, if a solar flare or EMP was to hit, what would it do to the hundreds and hundreds of nuclear reactors? We are joined now by Matthew Stein. He is a design engineer, a green builder, a graduate of MIT, holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and is the author of two best-selling books, When Disaster Strikes, A Comprehensive Guide to Emergency Planning and Crisis, and When Technology Fails, A Map.